that was really a great talk. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Especially, I'm glad that you, because I mentioned, maybe you mentioned some of the engineering that Cass are involved in doing it. I think you gave some real insight on that. So I've got a few questions, but we also, if uh, any of you in the audience have things you'd like to know, let me know as well. Um, maybe the first one is, David, for you, back in 1980 when you were first doing this, did you realize how long it would take to successfully make this measurement? <laughs> I don't, I don't, um, I, I don't think anybody realized how long it would take. Um, I will, I will, uh, I thought when I started, we, I think, uh, me and, and I worked with a graduate student, um, you know, we thought it would be a few years. And I can tell you that when the first graduate student, when we turned uh, Mark um, Harold? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mark Harold was the first graduate student, I think, who got his PhD on the on the 40 meter prototype. So mini LIGO, <coughs> it was before LIGO. Um, you know, when we switched it on, I think um, as, a, as an undergraduate, you know, we thought maybe we'll hit the lottery and, and get it. <laughs> and that was like in 83 or something. And, uh, you, know, I was dis you know, there was a little bit of disappointment, uh, but I think uh, no surprise. But um, I was offered a position in Ray Weiss' group at MIT to do my PhD with him. And I declined because I thought, oh, this is going to take 10 years, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was, while you're going through some of your talks, Dan, I was just wondering, what role did uh, computational ability, you know, the, the gradual improvement of electronics and computers have to, did that have any role to play in, in uh, building this right and, and making progress on it? I'm just curious about that. It, it made a huge difference, okay. actually. Okay. Uh, in, in the stuff I was talking about, you know, one of the big uh, places where the improvements in, uh, in computational ability made a, a difference was in the FFT modeling. Oh, yeah, I did mention So the FFT modeling was pretty rudimentary when we first started this and uh, computationally limited. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big deal when we were able to uh, do those reliably and, and with reasonable computing. That's fast for you, transforms, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the other place where, which I didn't mention, where computation, uh, improvements in computation made a big difference was in the uh, servo loops. Uh, I didn't talk about servo loops, but every place you turn in LIGO, there's a servo loop to control this length, to align this mirror, to, to uh, control this intensity. Okay. Every place, they're, they're just, just over and over and over again. In the beginning, all of those were done with conventional analog electronics. Uh, and the reason was that uh, digital electronics wasn't fast enough, the computational powers weren't there, A to Ds weren't fast enough, they weren't accurate enough, they didn't have enough, uh, enough bits, D to A's the same way. Um, and it was, uh, f you know, about midway through the project when uh, we started to do our first digital um, servo loops. And the, the, we had to stretch a lot, there was a lot of very tricky analog to digital uh, filtering that needed to be done where you'd filter something in analog, then you'd unfilter it in digital, you'd do the digital calculation, then you'd do the same filtering on the, the, the D to A side of things in order to uh, compensate for the limited electronics. Uh, but as electronics got better and better and better, the, the, those tricks uh, had to be, got to be less and less severe. And because of that, we were able to much, be much more agile in improving the uh, control systems, uh, you know, training them, and, and so on. And that was a huge, uh, a huge shift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, question. Go ahead. We're recording this. We need to. We're recording this. We'll take this now, but we'll, we like to have questions okay. at the end. Okay. Go ahead. It was just because it's about his noise chart, which he said is the most important. Am I reading it right that the seismic noise was bigger than everything else? Should I go back to it? Sure. <coughs> because uh, how did how do you, you know? Because I was wondering how you dealt with seismic noise. Because I, like this. I have a little bit of experience when I was an undergrad playing with geophones, and I could pick up trains miles away 
vibrating the ground. And that was just a coil and magnet type. Yeah, uh, and, and, and indeed the, the seismic noise was, was completely dominant. I mean, it is much larger. Uh, but it has a couple of characters. First of all, it's very large at low frequencies, and so we're trying to make our measurements mostly at, you know, tens of hertz and above, and that means uh, the seismic noise in that region has fallen rather rapidly. Also, the filtering we use, which is mechanical filtering, again, Brian's kind of an expert on this, that multi-stage pendulum, each stage of that pendulum provides a one over F squared filtering so you're getting, you know, with four stages of pendulum, you're getting, you know, eight powers of one over F to filter the noise, and that's the way you do this. So again and again and again, what you're finding is, what we're trying to do is just open up this one window of noise, not try to count, <coughs> conquer all noise at all places. So Stan, you're saying that the measurements are actually made in this frequency range here? Yeah. It just seems to me that there's, going to, that there's a lot of other things you'll be able to do better uh, because, we can, because we know more about those, those basic factors now. What do you think would be enabled um, in other areas because of the things you guys are uh, developing successfully in the world? Any idea? <laughs> <laughs> well, the... In, in this frequency band make the stable, most stable laser in the world. That technology for stabilizing the laser became uh, commonly used for precision timekeeping every place uh, around the world. Any place that does you know, precision stabilization, uh, atomic clock measurements now are done oftentimes this way. Uh, uh, quantum non, you know, quantum uh, information things oftentimes use the stabilization techniques that we have, cool laser cooling of <coughs> atoms and so on. All of those things oftentimes use the same laser stabilization technique. So that's just one place where a technology that was pioneered in LIGO was, was spun off. Do you have something? I was going to say the um, it's one of the technologies that we're looking at for next generation codings. Um, Stan was saying that. You know, if you do your job right on the seismic isolation and suspensions world, then the motion of that optical coating is driven driven by the, the thermal noise and its and its Q. Um, there's a, a bunch of work now on making crystalline coatings so that you can improve the Q of the coatings and driven partially by the by the lag of these and partially by the um, the precision timekeeping um, uh, folks. So those those coatings, the crystalline coatings, are are maybe an interesting technology that's uh, that's being developed now. So I'll give you um, something that working on LIGO helped me personally with, which is after after working on that, I looked at any other project I worked on and thought it said. You know, this isn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, now we've done it. You know, you got you know been successful in measuring gravity waves. We know they're there. We know we know way to measure. What's the next step? What are we going to do? Are we going to have gravity wave wave observatories? And if so, what are those going to look like? Yeah. I mean. The idea for LIGO is always, you know, if you look at the name, right, it's the gravitational, the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. And the hope is that you'll measure something to show that Einstein was once again right. But really the long-term objective is to really make an observatory so that you can spend a lot of time learning about the astrophysics um, and the astronomy. I think, you know, the very first measurement that we made of those binary black holes crashing into each other you know, that was the first time anyone had ever seen a black hole of that mass. It was the first time that anyone had ever observed a binary black hole system. Um, you've probably seen some of the other popular talks about, about that merger, but you know, for a brief moment that thing was something like 50 times as powerful as all of the other uh, stars in the universe, right? But wouldn't have even seen it 
right? We would have had no idea if it hadn't been for the, the machine, the detector being running. Um, there's a lot of, of astrophysics out there that we should be able to learn. That's, um, you know, Stan was saying that we're part of a collaboration of a thousand people, but actually the paper that we've got the most collaborators on is the binary neutron star paper, which is something like 3,500 co-authors, right? Where, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, so, you know, that's where we saw there was, a, there was a visible signal that came when the two neutron stars crashed into each other. So you have a gravitational wave from the in-spiraling neutron stars. And then you get gamma rays and optical signals, and you start to learn a lot about where things like the heavy elements in the universe come from. Um, as we make more and more powerful machines, we hope we'll be able to see you know, farther back uh, into the, the time of the universe, you know, start looking at black holes that were formed back at the time of the first stars that were formed. Um, you know, the big black hole in the middle of our galaxy, it's not actually clear how it got to be that size. Um, and maybe we can start to address questions like that. Or, you know, some people say like the, some of the smaller black holes, the 10 solar mass black holes, like, are those from collapsed stars or were those there from the very beginning of the universe? You know, if we can see black holes with like third generation machines, if we can see black holes that existed before or just as the first stars were burning, then it's likely those came from the Big Bang. So there's a lot of interesting, you know, cosmology, I think, that, uh, that, that's to be out there. That's what, I mean, that's what I'm really going for. Yeah, you really want to be an observatory. Cool. Are two enough to uh, play all the No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I I'd like to ask a question? Um, how do we know what's crashing together? Because you've been talking about black holes crashing together. Black hole. Yeah. yeah how, how do how do we know that? Well, so there's some interesting things you can learn by looking at the at the signal, right? So when you're doing a Astronomy, one of the big questions that you have is how far away is it, right? You don't know if it's a dim star that's close by or a bright star that's a long way away. It's very hard to, to know how big the star was, right? But with a binary neutron, or with, with a binary object that spins in, there's a very clear relationship between the rate at which it spins in and the masses, right? Because you know, as, it, as, it, as you get these two objects and they're orbiting, <laughs> like the as they orbit, they emit gravitational waves, and as they emit gravitational waves, the orbit collapses, like it's smaller, and so they go faster. And the rate at which that orbit spins in, right, is proportional to the mass of the objects. So by watching the rate of change of the gravitational wave, you can measure the mass of the objects, and so it gives you a pretty good estimate as to sort of how big those things were. <laughs> that's right. So, so first off, so you, now you know that it's a black hole, and it's, or you know that it's, it's something that's 30 solar masses, right? But you don't know how big it is, right? But then you can watch it spin in, right? And it's going to lap, it starts, you know, and the question is, how long does it act like two point masses, right? So, you know, if they're a long way apart, everything acts, pretty much everything acts like Right? If they're neutron stars, you can see maybe they start to flow into each other. Machines aren't quite <coughs> able to see that yet. Right? If they're black holes, what you can see is that they go faster and faster and get closer and closer right? until the distance between them right, is the radius of the black hole. And if it was bigger than a black hole, they would have crashed into each other. So you don't know that it's a black hole, but you do know that it's something that can't be any, or maybe not very much, bigger than a black hole. Right? So you get it, and then I mean, then there are complicated general relativity simulations that you can run, but just by watching that spiral, right, you know the mass and you know pretty much the maximum size. So that's how you can tell that it's okay. That's fine. We got a few questions over here. Let's see. Uh, let's start with that. Hey, in the back there. I see. Would we be able to understand anything about dark matter using this? Uh, yeah. Dark matter. <laughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, people have speculated that some of the dark matter, all of the dark matter, might be black holes that were left over from 
uh, the early universe formed before <coughs> atoms ever formed. They were, so they would be primordial black holes formed in the very early universe. Uh, and by doing a census of how many black hole binaries we see, we can put some constraints on whether that, uh, whether there are enough to provide uh, for them to be a candidate for the for the dark matter. The answer for that, I just saw a paper recently that said no more than 40% of the dark matter could be black holes. Now that depends on some assumptions about how massive the black holes are, what range of masses, and so on. But uh, those estimates will get more and more precise the, the more and more data we take. So we might be able to say that some fraction of the dark matter is, is actually in the form of black holes. Thank you. Yes, so, well, first of all, congratulations on the success of the experiment. Uh, I have to admit that I, pers I am a physicist and I personally never thought uh, it would work. So, <laughs> so, so to me, to me, um, and your results are impressive uh, and quite, quite convincing, but to me, the most important uh, question that is left to be answered uh, is that of quantum gravity. So uh, now, of course, the, the existence of uh, the ex existence of uh, gravitational waves doesn't mean that the gravitational field is quantized or that there is a, uh, a graviton. Uh, however, I, I was thinking, um, or I, I've been thinking, uh, in your experiment, uh, are there any routes or any 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 measurements that you can um, that, that are feasible at this point that can help us understand or, or prove the existence or not of a graviton by looking at correlations with uh, electromagnetic radiation and try to figure out if there are any couplings uh, beyond the standard model of physics and so forth. Yeah. Any, any, any uh, concepts uh, that you could provide on that regard? Well, I'm gonna give you sort of a a not probably very satisfying answer. Um, first of all, the, the strongest evidence, or, you know, the, the, a large part of the case for photons existing comes from the existence of electromagnetic radiation. Okay? So just the existence of gravitational radiation and confirming that it exists, we've made much more plausible the, the case that gravitons exist. Uh, we're probably never going, or certainly not in the very foreseeable future, going to be able to um, uh, see the interactions of individual gravitons with matter in the same way that we see photons interacting with matter. So that we're not probably going to see. On the other hand, we are able to measure, for example, the velocity of gravitational waves compared to, the, to light. Do they travel at the speed of light? If the graviton had a mass, then they would not travel, gravitational waves would not travel at the speed of light. So far we can put a, a constraint on that from the mass of the graviton from, from our measurements so far, and that will just get better and better and better. So we're, we may not be able to conclusively prove that gravitons exist, but we can place some constraints and, some, um, and find some information that, that uh, would support that as a, as a, as a possibility. I think we had a question. Actually, um, Steve over here had a question for a while. Uh, this is going to be a theoretically naive question, and I apologize for that, but I'm sort of stuck on your explanation of the space growing and shrinking uh, in the two axes differentially. And it suggested to me that is space incompressible because of that? Are those amplitudes equal, or do we know the answer to that? <laughs> Space is very incompressible. Okay, um, and and the fact that it's the the fact that they are predicted to be the same is in fact a little bit of a statement of that. Um, when you think about, you know, Brian mentioned that this um, neutron, this binary black hole event that we saw, the amount of energy that was emitted during that last fraction of a second of that first event that we saw was 50 times more, the energy emitted in that period of time, 
than all of the stars in all of the galaxies in the observable universe, okay, during that same period of time. An enormously powerful event, and yet it made, you know, it made a 10 to the minus 21 change in, in the space. That already tells you that space is very, very incompressible. Don't budge much. I think you I think we're going to right No, I think these guys will work over here. Yeah, just quickly, I guess this was recorded in, what, 2015 or something? Well, since then, what what have you found? I mean, what, were there other things happening? Yeah, what have you done for slavery? <laughs> <laughs> so we've, uh, so LIGO's completed two observing runs, um, O01 and O02, whichever name they are. Um, <laughs> in the second part, at the end of the second observing run, we were joined by Virgo, which is a French-Italian collaboration for the detector as well, which is incredibly useful. Um, we've got, what, 5.87 binary black holes now? Um, five that we're sure of and one that we're not quite sure of. It's the 0.87. Um, sorry. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, signal's not all that big, so it could be noise, but probably not. Um, and one binary neutron star. Um, the, the, as I said, you know, Virgo joined um, up at the end of O2, and so we had, which was incredibly useful. You asked me a minute ago, it's two enough, right? You really, you really want at least three. You, know, you want two so that you can make sure that you see the same signal. But if you have three, then you can do triangulation. Um, and having Virgo uh, up when the binary neutron star happened gave us a location in the sky where the event was. And so that's how we got the, the optical um, telescopes uh, knew where to look. Um, it wasn't particularly local, it was like 30 square degrees, so it's kind of <laughs> We thought it was awesome, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 we, but we, knew the, we knew we had a pretty good guess for the range, too. Uh, so there are only about 50 <laughs> galaxies in that volume of space. So with the modern telescopes, if they know where all the galaxies are, they can just like scan through them. Um, and found it within like 40 minutes of when they started. Well, they found it very fast. Yeah, you know, it was very fast. Once they once once the sun set, um, they could look. You know, the, the, they could put telescopes up uh, up towards the event. Um, yeah. So one binary neutron star and almost six black holes. And then we start the next observing run in February of next year. Um, so hopefully there'll be there'll be more. Okay. And and we expect eventually to start to see another kind of source, which is isolated neutron stars that rotate that have an asymmetry. If you if you put a bump on a neutron star and it rotates very rapidly, it will emit a continuous tone of gravitational waves. Much weaker, but because it's continuous, you can integrate for a long time to see it. We haven't seen those yet, but but we're, we're thoroughly expecting to see them in the not terribly distant future. Probably, I would guess 03, we'll see them. But, uh, you know, I can't prove it, because we haven't seen it yet. I think so Bruce, did you have one? Let's see it, Bruce, first. I have a, a comment, which is uh, in appreciation of uh, this effort and how successful it's been, and that is to point out that for for human for the, for all of human history, we have been observing the universe with electromagnetic radiation, and this is a historic moment that we have the privilege to be alive during when astronomy now uh, expands to include another kind of detection, a different kind of observation of the universe using a, something other than light, something other than gamma rays, something other than infrared. And so this is really a remarkable addition to the armory of of humanity's um, understanding and appreciation of the universe around us. So uh, if you want to join me in congratulating <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs>
So I'd like to ask a history question. Back in the 70s, there were other attempts, Joe Weber, uh, Dick Garwin. Did those have any influence, or were they just complete dead ends? Uh, the primeval history. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that falls to me, being almost of that era. Um, the technique that was used by those early things was to look at the vibrations of a large uh, bar. Most of them were aluminum bars. Joe Weber had about a ton of aluminum in a cylinder, and he would look for the vibrations. The idea is the gravitational wave coming through would excite the resonance of that bar, and by carefully measuring, he would be able to detect it. Um, uh, those techniques, it turns out, uh, for a long time were the most sensitive for looking, but they soon ran up against some really tough uh, detection problems. First of all, they detect the energy that's deposited in the bar. And that goes like, so the sensitivity in some sense goes, uh, your energy sensitivity every time you improve a factor of 10, you actually only improve in your H by a factor of square root of that amount because the energy in the wave is H squared. Whereas these interferometers, by measuring the amplitude of the wave, every time we make a factor of two improvement, we get a factor of two in H. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it eventually, they eventually kind of lost uh, out in a competitive way. <coughs> On the other hand, they're not exactly dead ends. Many of the concepts that we you know, eventually had to deal with, thermal noise, uh, the seismic isolation techniques that were, are used, the concept of uh, you know, quantum non-demolition, which is a, a really important issue as we're going forward. Uh, those kinds of things were almost all uh, first explored in the context of bars and then uh, taken over in one way or another to the interferometers. So we, we owe an awful lot of our heritage to the, the scientific contribution that those bars made. Wasn't there uh, somebody? Wasn't there somebody at the uh, uh, California State University Stanislaus that was, he was trying to build a superconducting seismometer to look at the vibration of the whole earth as one of those resonant devices? Because I went to some talks when I was an undergrad around that time, and he was showing data where he could show all the modal vibrations of the earth when earthquakes happened. Yeah, that's another way of doing it, uh, and, and that's to, for the most for the most part to uh, look at lower frequencies than than the bar detectors and, and the, the aluminum bar detectors and what we're looking at. Those things are 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 hard because the Earth is not a particularly quiet transducer to, to be used. <laughs> um, and and you were able to see all those earthquakes because it's such a noisy thing. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll we'll find that that's probably I, there have been some people who've been trying to look at things like that. I think they're, I think it's pretty speculative yeah, still. The, the, that had been proposed, and, and I, I don't know if anyone actually ever put a accelerometer on the moon to look for. Just, just one that doesn't. Yeah. 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 I gather doing a run is a fairly complicated event since you've only done two. Could you give a thumbnail of what's involved? More than just calling the guy up and saying, let's, let's do one this weekend. <laughs> I'll try that one? Yeah. No, well, it, well, it Stan, uh, Stan's actually been closer to a number of them than I have. So we've actually done uh, eight. So with initial LIGO, we did five. Um, then we made some small improvements to, LIGO, to initial LIGO and did um, a sixth run with the initial, basically with, basically with the initial machine. And then advanced LIGO has done two more. Um, we alternate, I mean, as a project, we sort of alternate back and forth between, you know, taking data and monkeying with the machine, right? We love monkeying with the machine. <laughs> um, if we got our ways, we'd probably never actually take data. We'd <laughs> <laughs> um, probably quit paying you money. <laughs> You know, so what you may, but, but so what you do is you try and 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 establish a cadence between um, making some upgrades so that um, the next time you stop, you'll make a significant uh, scientific improvement in what you can see. 
right? So for example, you, um, right, so we finished O2, we're starting O3. Um, in that sort of year or so that we've been offline, um, we've doubled the laser power, we've um, replaced um, one of the mirrors that had a defect on sort of off to the edge, had a big absorbing defect, so it messed up the, the wave front of the optic because it got hot at one point off center. Um, we are, it's probably the two, anyway, so things like that. Um, and then you, so you make a bunch of hardware changes based on what you've learned. Um, you close everything, close the vacuum system back up, and then you spend several months retuning the instrument and trying to, you know, make sure that everything is working in the way that you expect. You look for various noise sources. Um, sometimes in these talks you'll see curves like this, but instead of being a smooth line that says number 10, there'll be a series of data curves, and you can watch the, the, the actual noise of the instrument move down um, as we get you know, lower and lower strain noise as you make various updates to it. And so, so the idea is to get all three observatories on the same window at about the same time that's and then right. watch for two months? Uh, so O3 is going to be about a year. Um, it, it, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you've got scheduling of of people and, and you know the regular maintenance operations that need to go on. You, know, you you need to patch all of your operating systems periodically so you don't end up being hacked and you need to <laughs> well, rebuild well, the guess. laser cooling water and so on. So all that back is as a guess in a year would you expect to see three or four events or one event or do you have any idea? Uh, in, in in this upcoming run? will be more sensitive, so we'll see them at a higher rate, and I, I suspect we'll see, uh, I would be a little disappointed if we don't see a dozen events in the, in the next this one around. Yeah, would there be any advantage to putting an observatory in, in free space rather than on the, uh, on the surface? Oh, uh, putting in outer space itself, you're saying? Oh, right. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, in fact, there's a project called LISA, which is to build a gravitational wave detector in outer space. And it would be three separated spacecraft with interferometer beams running between them. And there, instead of having like a four kilometer arm, you might have a five million kilometer wide arm. <laughs> um, and the benefit that you get, right, so you see like the seismic noise is limiting us at low frequencies. So the, the, the advantage of a machine like that is that you can do the same kind of detection but at a much lower frequency. And so you can look for much heavier sorts of objects as they inspire. There is uh, one over here, that guy, yeah. And my small basic question, so does the orientation of the two-arm metal, so uh, typical uh, traditional telescope, you can aim at something, right? For this one, Besides the location of multiple sensor, does the uh, how to place the uh, two arm also make a difference? Uh, the the way I described the operation of the detector, I talked about a wave coming straight down on it, stretching one arm and shrinking the other one. <coughs> but if you think about it, in fact, the interferometer is sensitive to waves coming from essentially all directions. So if it comes in along one arm, it can still shrink and stretch that the other arm, okay? And so it's not quite as sensitive to other other directions of incidence, but but it's sensitive to almost all orient almost all directions for the gravitational waves. And in fact, the gravitational waves go completely through the Earth without any attenuation. So it actually is looking both up and down at the same time. So to first order. Each of these is an omnidirectional detector, and we get our any directional sensitivity by combining the the, um, uh, the outputs of multiple detectors. How do you measure the speed of a gravitational wave? Oh, the question was how do you measure the speed of the gravitational wave? So for the for the you just have two black holes, you, you can't really. 
Um, maybe there's some clever way, but the way we did it was to look at the binary neutron star. So what you can see in that case is that there's a, a chirp <coughs> from the gravitational waves where you know, the frequency goes up and the amplitude gets bigger until the two objects merge. Um, and then 1.7 seconds later, there was a burst of gamma rays that we picked up with, that was picked up on the Fermi telescope. And so you get a range, you, you find it with the optical scopes, and you say, well, it's in a galaxy that's um, 130 million light years away. Um, and then you can say, well, um, we know that the gamma, so if you presume that right, you know, within a few seconds of the merger, you emitted those, those gamma rays, right? Then you can say, well, we've gone 130 million years, right? Um, and the difference between the gamma rays, the light, and the gravitational waves was about 1.7 seconds. So they, that. Right? So, so we know that, that the difference in the speeds, you know, is it's about one part of 10 to the 15 is what it, so what it works out to be. And then you can put some you know, range of limits on it and say what well, that might be reasonable for that. And that's how you can put limits on the how close to C, how close to speed of light, or the speed of the gravitational waves is. My question is about how was this thing built? Was there distributed vacuum pumps throughout its entire length? Oh yeah, what do you suck on? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a in, in fact, we only have um, vacuum pumps at the ends and at the middle of the arms. So we, we have, in fact, very low outgassing stainless steel with, with minimal, uh, minimal number of vacuum ports any place along the tube. Uh, the, those ports are all just blocked with, with blank off flanges, and we're able to achieve 10 to the minus 8 vacuum with pumping just at the ends and at the, the corner, uh, the center midpoint of the arms. And that's because it's very low outgassing steel, very clean, and it has very high conductance to the end because of the large diameter of the two. So, let's get one. Get another one. I'm going to ask one of them. So, a quick one. Uh, this is the gentleman who said no. that we have a new way of measuring. Uh, uh, sorry if this is a stupid question, but would this LIGO or LIGO help? Uh, on determining whether it's string theory, I mean, right now string theory has been focused on the on the small yes. masses, uh, but but if string theory is supposed to be the theory of everything, uh, could like Lego help in that regard? Just I am not. You don't want to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not an expert on string theory. I, there are some theories that have cosmic, probably cosmic super strings uh, that we, that, that, <laughs> have, that have the potential of, <laughs> of, see, of, be, of emitting gravitational waves. So under certain circumstances, cosmic super strings can develop kinks, and the kinks will emit bursts of gravitational waves. Uh, we have done some searches for those. We haven't found any. Uh, the limits that we place on the existence of these cosmic strings is interesting in some ranges of parameter space, but not generally constraining yet. Tom, Tom has a question. Tom. With electromagnetic radiation, when, when you have a few particles in there, like you have the residual gas in your tube, it interacts and slows it down a little bit, and you get an index of refraction. Is there anything like that for gravitational waves? You go through regions of space with more or less mass, do you get any change in the propagation? My, my GR friends tell me that there's just a little bit of scattering that you get, and it's extremely small. Like I think that's the phrase. You add to that, you get you get dispersion, you know, wavelength dispersion like you do with light. We haven't seen it. Um, you can look, you know. So as I was saying, you know, you can predict the waveform of the gravitational. 
gravitational wave, right? Two point masses spinning around. Um, and you ought to see an evolution of that waveform as time as the two objects get closer and closer together. Um, and, and so, right, and so when the waves get emitted, right, so you have some pulse train which is changing in frequency, right? And when you measure it, you have a pulse change which is changing in frequency, right? And so if there's some dispersion, you might expect that that, that pulse train would change, right? Yeah, it gets smeared, it'll it gets smeared out. out. Smeared um, out. And, and so far, you know, so what you do is like you have a whole bunch of templates, and you say, well, how well can I match, you know, my data to those templates, and does it help, right? If I use some, if I put some dispersion, in, then you can put some limits on it. And so far, all the limits we have are that there isn't like all that our results are completely consistent with no dispersion. Yeah, because I know that right. I, I know that the interstellar media creates dispersion at radio and light. And yeah. that was de detected even back in the 60s, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I've got a question. I put this picture up here because, uh, so yeah, it's sort of a practical question. What were the unique, um, uh, unique situations you ran into building in Hartford, Washington, which you can see is a pretty dry place, and then building in Livingston, Louisiana, which you can see there's actually a big moat <laughs> alongside your line there. <laughs> Do you, do, you, do you guys know any good stories about the differences in trying to build these two, these uh, similar structures but in two different places? The, well, the, the both of them. The character, one of the characteristics we were looking for in both locations, we wanted the detectors to be perfectly flat on the Earth, at least as perfectly flat as the curvature of the Earth would allow. So that means uh, over four kilometers, we didn't allow more than about a meter of variation in the, in the surface terrain, a meter or two. Um, in Louisiana, that's in a very swampy forested area. It's a, a forest that's harvest, harvested for paper pulp production. Um, and so we had to raise the facility up above the 100-year floodplain, or maybe the 500-year floodplain. So what you do is you dig alongside, you pile up the dirt, you use a little bit of concrete mixed with the dirt to help stabilize it, and that creates a four kilometer long uh, lake next to your detector. <laughs> uh, that quickly fills up with an alligator. An alligator. <laughs> Um, the guys that are doing the construction decide that it's really fun to go out at their lunch hour, the, you know, the constructing buildings and so on. They like to go out at their lunch hour and throw bits of chicken and, and donuts to the, to the alligator, um, quite forgetting that they're eventually going to be leaving and, and they will leave us with, you know, a 10-foot predator who, 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 who associates the arrival of a car with there's going to be something to eat here soon. Uh, so, so we actually did have to have the alligator relocated. <laughs> Probably not, not a similar story for Hanford, though. Uh, well, Hanford also has its own set of stories. It's on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Right. It is. Huh? It's it's on the it's so it's in the area that they were using as sort of a security buffer zone. Um, uh, that facility it looks really bad in that picture because that picture was taken just after uh, we'd had a wildfire through there. It had burned all of the sagebrush in that area. Uh, fortunately, we kept a clearance zone around our buildings, uh, and we didn't have any any damage to our buildings. But uh, there were a lot of scared people for for several days while that happened. So yeah, we had uh, individual uh, excitements. excitements both places. Yeah. Yeah. If I heard you, you said you're getting 10 to the minus 8 tor for your vacuum. What what is the limitation? Why can't you go to 10 minus 10 or 10 minus 11? It's not. It's Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have done it for my PhD thesis at 10 minus 11 in Cornell. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Chess system. So. Yeah. I, I, the the limit we have is the outgassing of the stainless steel. When you buy stainless steel, you you buy if you buy a pound of stainless steel, you buy roughly a pound of stainless steel and about. 
10 to the minus 4 pounds of hydrogen embedded in the stainless steel from the, from the uh, process. And that hydrogen migrates through the matrix of the stainless steel and out gases. Uh, we have a treatment for our stainless steel that reduces the outgassing rate by about a factor of 10 uh, compared with what's typical from stainless steel that we found, for example, with uh, accelerator physicists. Uh, we did tendomize 8 just because it was good enough. Uh, we did put vacuum ports all along the, the beam tube just in case we needed to go to another factor of 10 better vacuum or, or in case we goofed and, and uh, our processing didn't quite work out and give us the outgassing rate that we expected. So we have the capability if we needed to, but we, you know, at the moment the, the outgassing rate is acceptable. That, that actually raises an interesting question. How many different ways did you design um, the system so that your mistakes could be compensated for <laughs> relatively easily? <laughs> I'm good with you anticipating what people want. <laughs> I mean, one of the things we did between, I mean, we talked about, I mean, talked about, you know, 001 being the first observing run for advanced LIGO. The, um, the facility, the buildings and the vacuum systems were put together to be much more um, high performance than we needed for the initial LIGO. It was probably one of the smart things that they did for the initial proposal was to make the facilities really good. <laughs> So for the advanced LIGO upgrade, we more or less took out everything that was in the vacuum system, like all, all, all of it, right? So all the mirrors, all the seismic isolation systems, all the computers, the laser, like all that stuff got, got replaced. And you know maybe it was that foresight in making a, a nice facility that you could put every kind of upgrade into was what actually made advanced LIGO possible. So I mean, every subsystem, got in place in order to actually actually measure the first gravitational waves. I have a question then. Um, so how much was the actual cost <coughs> versus the actual budget to either one of these facilities? I think that the initial LIGO was three hundred and sixty five million, including personnel and the advanced LIGO hardware upgrade was like another two hundred million. Something something like that? The initial LIGO construction proposal was $200 million. Um, after we started construction, uh, we went through a management chain change, and that got bumped up to about $265 million, I believe is the number. Um, and then we, that didn't include the initial operating and commissioning money. And so that came in, that give, brought it up to about that $365 million that you talked about. So to actually get us from the point of construction up to commissioning and the beginning of science, uh, uh, science runs, taking data, was about $365 million. Uh, the advanced LIGO upgrade was another $220 million, I think, of which uh, about... <coughs> 30 million, I believe, came from overseas, overseas partners, and uh, the remainder came from the National Science Foundation. There's also an operating budget for the laboratory, which by this time has, it's gone through, you know, 10 years of operations or more, uh, 12 years of operations. So Not that's, so bad. An, that's another, you know, Several, like? several hundred million dollars. So we're, we're at this point, we've probably got a billion dollars into the project. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, in terms of what you originally thought, what you know, spending did sound too, you know, too, for, too much higher. Yeah, for the original proposal, it, yeah. I mean, to, to get where we were, it was less than a factor of two, exactly, yeah. um, and and probably really closer to thirty percent if you compare out of that. That's very very good. There's a question over here. I'm amazed at the perseverance <laughs> to get us here. Um, so I have a question. I'll preface with a story that goes way back. It's uh, my brief connection with LIGO. When I was in graduate school at Cornell with Dave, I remember Kip Thorne come through, came through and, and was going around basically campaigning for that initial $300 million uh, proposal. And he gave a, a talk at the physics department, Colloquia, and 
he had this graph, and I remember, and it was a detectivity, optical detectivity versus gear, and had various detectors showing the march and progress of detectors, and they had a horizontal line that was, of course, the detectivity needed to make it work, and, and it had this detector above the line, you know, like five years out, it was a PFD, it was, and they had photomultipliers and acronyms I knew because I was an optics lasers guy, I thought, what is that PFP? So at the end of the talk, I you know, raised my hand. I asked him to go back to that foil. I said, what is, what is that detector? He says, that's possible future detector. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't provide that information until he was asked. So my question then is, what are the detectors you What optical detectors are used for the interferometer? It's just, uh, I can guess, photodiodes. Just, just diodes. Yeah. I believe the first one is now it's in, it's in Stockholm, right? Yeah, the one that was when when Ray and Barry and Kip were awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, you take along some bits of stuff to put into the museum, and one of the things that is there now is like is one of the photodiodes that was used to to make the detection. Yeah, they're not they're RF. Those were RF diodes. Um, so they're not very big. And they're very high quantum efficiency. Because um, you want to count every photon you can, that, that you can get. Um, but yeah, it's just... Are they avalanche or... No. No, they're just plain photodiodes. Just plain photodiodes. Okay. There's one over here. There's, there's actually... A, the, the, you asked about avalanche photodiodes. It's actually... The, the issue is that we have a very high signal in terms of number of photons. We don't need to count individual oh, okay. photons. What we really need to do is count that large number of photons very accurately. And so the, the probably the bigger issue on the photodiodes is having sufficient dynamic range to count all the photons you need and still have the noise low enough to get the kind of signal to noise that you need. For Cool. Cool. Uh, yes, do, do we cool them for thermal noise? No, we don't cool them. Hi, uh, so what happens to these uh, gravitational waves once they get emitted by a binary system? Do they keep propagating for the rest of time, the rest of future, forever? Or can they be absorbed or attenuated? And, and another question is probably very basic, I'm not a physicist. And how does it compare to light? Does light, for example, from the sun, does it ever get absorbed anywhere? Or it keeps flying into space all, all over in the future? Right. So, you know, if you're, if, like for that binary neutron star, right, you know, we measured, well, the science community measured a bunch of those photons that came off of it, right, and those are, those all got absorbed in the various detectors, <laughs> right. The gravitational waves came through LIGO, you know, they distorted the space a little bit and they just kept right on going, and they will, you know. Does that lose energy? Um, they scatter very slightly. I, I don't think they lose energy. Uh, I don't know the actual, I don't know the veracity of this, but one of my relativity friends who might have won a Nobel Prize once told me that the absorption length of gravitational waves in neutron star material, which is the densest matter we know, is the Hubble distance. <laughs> so that's the, that's the one over E distance for absorbing gravitation. So effectively, they're unattenuated by matter any, at any appreciable or measurable uh, level. So I've got a little comment um, with regard to counting photons, because we're talking a little bit about that. That retro reflector on the moon, just a little data point that's quite fascinating. That 1.2 gigawatt laser that sends that signal to the moon, uh, it spreads out to be about two to three miles wide around the retro reflector. And so only a small portion of those photons actually enter the retro reflector. When those get sent back to the Earth, we measure between one and five photons <laughs> to, to know the distance to the moon. Little data point there. Um, let's see a question down here. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. What's sure. Your <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I think I was told by someone that the sensitivity is enough that if people are walking around in the control room, 
the change in the gravity due to people walking around was detectable on the instrument. Is that true? Seismically. No, not seismic, just the just mass. The, their, their mass. Their mass. Uh, mass. Actually, you know, Kip, Kip did a, um, a fun study back, Kip Thorne did a fun study back, I guess when I was in grad school. So looking at um, the impact of people walking around, sort of the, the possible future detectors. And you know, if you've got some vacuum chamber here, you know, you've got some person walking past. And then you can ask the question, you know, so you know, remember LIGO's detection band starts at about 10 hertz and moves up to a couple of kilohertz. So what is it that that you see, right? It's not your head, which kind of moves at a constant rate, right? It turns out it's your feet, because right? your feet start and stop and start and stop and start and stop. Also things to make value with that Right. So as the you know, as the mass of your feet is accelerating, right? So you see these these distortions in local gravity pulling on the mirror, right? Oh, you thought you saw it. So his, his thing, his, his guess was that about, maybe about, it was about 10 meters from the vacuum system to avoid the jerk vents. Really? Wow. Um, in fact, wow. the next, we're actually trying to build a, calibrating these machines <laughs> is a bit of a, bit of an art. Um, <laughs> one of the pieces of hardware that we're trying to get installed now is a gravitational calibrator. So it's a piece of aluminum, it's about yay big, um, and it's got some heavier objects set into it, and you spin it. And the changing gravitational field of the little heavy object is only a few kilograms. Um, you can clearly see that moving the mirror. Right? As you move it from you know, here, where the, where the field is a little smaller, yeah. to here, where the field is a little bigger. You can see that the Virgo guys have actually installed one of these, um, and you can clearly see it in their case. You know, I did not see a, a human and animal noise source. Uh, through yeah, you just don't go near it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they, they turn off the lights and they close the big room. Keep the rats off, too. Other <laughs> <laughs> stories? The alligators. <laughs> um, how many? So you guys mentioned like 35, no, 30, 3,500 uh, people that were in the original paper, right? Oh, oh. On the binary neutron star. The binary neutron star. That's binary neutron star. Okay. How many people and how many places are involved in this? For the binary neutron star? No, just in general. No, for LIGO? Yeah. Um, let's see. So it's a pretty it's big collaboration. It's about, I think right now we're about 1,200 people and about 1,000 folks huh. who contribute more than 50% of their time. So if you contribute 50% of your time, yeah. You could be on the author list, uh, and they're about so it's not you know not everyone manages to you know, they have real jobs right so um, <laughs> and we're about how many universities are sixty five sixty five yeah um, and they're universities from all around the U S some have very large groups like Caltech some have not very particular not very big groups like Stanford um, some have just a few like a few professors were working on it. Um, they're big. Carlton, Carlton, yeah, Carlton, 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 yeah. Well, right. one, one professor. Right. Right. Um, there's big international, you know, participation as well. Right. Um, you mentioned France. Okay. Yeah. So there's a bunch of universities in France and Italy who are and the uh, Netherlands and Spain, who are in Hungary and Poland, um, who are in the Virgo, who are on the Virgo detector, um, and there are a bunch of universities in Europe who work on the LIGO detectors, mm -hmm. um, and then we've got collaborators in um, South Korea, and a bunch, a bunch in Australia. It's a very large community in Australia. India. India, we're building the third LIGO detector in India. Right. Yeah, so that's gonna be a big deal. That's gonna be exciting. Right. Um, the Japanese also have a detector, which is just now coming online. They have four. So, um, well, five, right? So if there's, there's oh, France. Yeah, sorry, yeah, right, so soon, so it's a big, it's a big community, and you need, you really want that, right? Because having a big network of detectors allows you to do the source locations, um, and it gives you much more confidence in, in the signals if you can see the same thing on multiple signals. The duty cycle of the machines is not perfect, so if you've got a little bit of redundancy, it's much more likely that you'll have 
more than one machine running. Um, yeah. So it's wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big community. Uh, let's see. Oh, you got a microphone. Excuse me. What fundamental assumptions did you make that proved to be wrong? <laughs> no hard questions. You've got to slog it out. I'll say it out of that all. Uh, no degrees will be received. I don't know that we've made fundamental decisions that were wrong. We started off with um, we started off with uh, using argon ion lasers, which at the time we started working with were the highest power visible lasers around. Uh, we probably were slower to convert to uh, solid state uh, IR lasers than we should have been. Uh, so that's a place where I think we didn't move quite as adroitly as we probably should have. Um, See, maybe another technical issue that we ran into is that, you know, you look at these noise curves and you see the detection band starts at 10 hertz for advanced LIGO and 40 hertz for initial LIGO. And so a lot of assumptions were made about the performance of the control system and how well you can keep the machine at its operating point um, by pushing on it at low frequencies, moving the optics around at low frequencies. Um, and the coupling from the low frequency stuff into the high, higher frequency and in terms of operations, I think was a surprise. I know in, in Louisiana, in the beginning of initial LIGO, we actually couldn't run the machine in the daytime because the ground motion was big enough and the isolation systems weren't quite tuned right um, that the, the, the human generated noise at a few hertz was enough that you couldn't actually keep the keep the optical cavities on resonance. Wow. So that was a bit of a bit of a heartache. Uh, eventually, again, it's not really a fundamental thing, though. It's just a it's just a one of a multitude of complicated technical things. I was sort of close to that one, which is why I think. How, how powerful were those lasers? Uh, well, the initial argon ion lasers were, were typically, they were rated to 10 watts, uh, but by the time you would make them single frequency, single line, they five, four or five watts was about what we could get. I feel like the 1.2 gigawatt one that's used for the Well, you know, we need single frequency, single mode, you know, uh, single longitudinal mode, single transverse mode lasers, and, and by the time you take any High power laser and, and filter it to get those things. It's it's, it's a little bit harder to, to get high powers. Uh, so we have you know solid state lasers which are rated at 120 watts or something like that, but we don't really actually ever get that. Maybe have time for one more question. Uh, you mentioned a uh, duty cycle for your observations. I'm kind of wondering you know, how long have you been online? How much time were you actually observing versus down for whatever reason? And similar observatories, similar question? I'd say for the last, for the last, so when you plan to be running, so during the observing run, right? So we, we, we plan to be running about half you know, taking these <coughs> alternating steps back and forth. So you're commissioned for a while, then you run for a while. And that's about 50, 50, something like that, right? During the observing run, you hope to be running most of the time. Um, in the last one, the individual machines were sort of at, sort of in their detection parameter space, about two thirds of the time for each of the two US machines. I don't. Virgo was a little better than that, I think, but I'm, actually, I'm not sure about Virgo. There's a, there's a shorter one in northern Germany, the geodetector, um, which is more used for sort of advanced technology development. That has a, that's, that's got a very good duty cycle. Um, the coincident time for O2 for us was about 45% of the time. So, 
something that I spend a lot of time thinking about when I'm not here talking to you guys. So is that, that, make that better? Is that 45% of the 50%? So during, during the observing during the observing run, yeah. Right. So, so 22, 25 percent of the time, what kind of Well, so one question, oh, yeah. which is, okay, if somebody here wanted to go visit LIGO, LIGO and take a look at it, can they do that? Well, I saw an email uh, earlier today about an MIT trip there, I think next March, something like that. The bus to Hanford or something? No, it was like the, to Louisiana. Oh, Louisiana. So, so MIT has organized uh, some yes. trek, I think, in March. Yeah, the, the easiest way is to be um, a school kid in Livingston Parish, Louisiana. Because <laughs> they have, I mean, they have tours. The, the, the local schools um, are often out there a couple of times a week. And um, there's, a beautiful, there's a beautiful science center, actually, in Louisiana, which is put together in conjunction with folks from the Exploratorium. And all um, here. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and yeah, so we just, and then there are public tours more or less once a month, I think. Yeah, something like that. Um, so folks from just general folks from the community can come out, uh, come out and, and visit the sites. Well, let's see. I think we have one last uh, question, and then we're going to wrap it up. All right. Yeah. Uh, as an existence proof, uh, we went on a bus tour. To Livingston uh, from a uh, frequency control conference uh, meeting in uh, in Louisiana, which was enhanced by having Joe Taylor on our bus, which made them roll out the red carpet. And uh, the director of the uh, facility was our guide. Uh, a question on, on the, you know uh, machines like this typically you look back some decades later and you say, wow, how did we ever get away with that? You know, I mean, look at how awful it is compared to what we now know. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have comments on, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, you're using uh, stainless steel, why not uh, the stuff they use in vacuum tubes that doesn't outcast, or more getters, or uh, uh, in uh, um, uh, decades ago it was discovered how to remove the molding from uh, cavity magnetrons. Is there a way to do that with uh, uh, future, uh, you know, uh, the, the, PF lasers. <laughs> and, you know, just general questions about what do you see as the uh, the next steps that might give you a, a, a decade of additional sensitivity. Just to pick a number. It's going to be a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think I'll pick three bits of technology that are that are coming in the next few years to a decade. Um, one of the, there's a cool piece of technology that we're hoping to put in in about five years, which is we're already now installing squeezed light into the machine um, so that it looks like we have more power than we actually do, um, which means that you do better at high frequencies where you're limited by shot noise, and probably a little worse at low frequencies where you're limited by the photon coil pressure, which is sort of the, the conjugate of the of the noise from that in a in the most simple minded uh, quantum mechanical way, which is still really not, not easy for me to explain. But but soon we're actually gonna be doing a trick where you um, adjust the squeezing of the light so that at high frequencies you squeeze it to get better shot noise and at low frequencies you squeeze it in a different way to get less radiation pressure. And so there's this frequency dependent squeezing, which I think is gonna be a very cool piece of technology going into about five years. I think the next thing that we wanna do, um, you know, Stan was saying that right now that the thermal noise of the optics is one of the real limiting factors. And the most sensitive frequency band that we have right now, we're limited by the thermal noise of the coatings. A bunch of people actually at Stanford were working on better optical coatings. Um, but of course, what you say to yourself is, well, if you're limited by the thermal noise, why don't you make the temperature lower? So there are a bunch of us who are working on um, putting in large low temperature optics. Low temperature is probably 123 Kelvin with silicon, where 
the, the coefficient of thermal expansion goes through zero, so it turns out to be a very interesting place to work. But, but if you can lower the temperature and you do the engineering right, you ought to be able to lower the thermally driven noise of the machine. Why, why, do, you coat, why do you coat the mirrors? Um, wait, hold on to that for just a second. The next thing to do after you make the mirrors cold and you put in fancy squeezing is you just make the machines bigger. So for a couple of billion dollars, you could take a four kilometer <laughs> mark you know, and make it into a 10 to 40 kilometer mark. That's where one you might do in space. And you know, it's still probably cheaper to do that one on the ground, um, but there are people working on putting in the space um, and make, just making the whole machines much, much bigger. And that, of course, you know, it's, it's, that requires a lot of money and a lot of international collaboration, and those conversations are just getting started, but they're very interesting. So yes, yeah, so you need to coat the mirrors. So the you want, you want another? I don't know if I, so. You want the noise one? No. There's a noise one. Look, the one of the tricks that we do is not only do we have very long arms, but we make them appear even longer than they really are by bouncing the light back and forth a bunch of times between the mirrors. And we don't actually. So the way we do that is we build an optical cavity, right? So you store the light in the arm. It's about three hundred times. Mm -hmm. um, Confocal? Not quite. Um, and if you're going to do that, you need very high performance coatings. Right? So you have just the right amount of reflectivity in your mirrors, but also you don't absorb the power, right? which helps keep the quality factor of the optics very high. And when you build, make the quality factor of the optics very high, you start to get tens or hundreds of kilowatts circulating in the arm. And so you need very good, you also need very good coatings so that you don't absorb a lot of power. So you need very, yeah, the are coatings are real. Multi-layer coatings? Yeah, they're multi-layer dialectics. Okay, yeah. They're very much like you see yeah. in other high performance optics. Right. They're, just, they're just bigger, they have very good, about half PPM optical absorption. So it's very good, very good coatings. So uh, if I need to wrap it up. Yep, on that note. Oh. Uh, thank you very much to the panel and thank you very much for organizing this kind of conference.